the Gospel of Luke. It is good to see everybody here this morning. <clears throat> Thank you so much again for having us. Good to have my family here this morning. And uh, as Brother Jimmy said, we're just a few days away from probably the, as far as us as Christians, you know, we, we love to celebrate the virgin birth of our Savior. And as Christians, we should desire to celebrate His death and His resurrection. Amen? Amen. Um, I'll go ahead and tell this story. I told some of my family, it's good to have my family here. So say hey to them uh, on the way out today. But I already told them this yesterday. I said, uh, I'm, I'm going to share the story tomorrow. And because uh, it's special to me is uh, in 2008, uh, my grandfather, Roy Gann, of course, he passed away in October of that year. But the last sermon I got to hear him preach, uh, as, as far as being able to see him, was the Palm Sunday triumphal entry of 2008, before he died just six months later. Now, I don't know, I, I was talking to Randy about it. I'm sure he preached sometime in, in that time frame. He may not have, I'm sure he did, but I didn't get to see him. So from this very pulpit, I was sitting about where Brother Aubrey's sitting, uh, I got to see, this was the last sermon that I heard him preach before he died. So this is very special uh, for me uh, and, and our family. And so uh, keep us in your prayers. We're just a few days away from our Savior being crucified on a cross. I don't know if you ever watched the movie, The Passion of the Christ. I've only seen it once. It's not that I just don't want to see it. I just, I just haven't watched it again. But the one time that I watched it, although it gives us a picture of what happened, we still, it still doesn't even touch, even come close to what it looked like on that Friday. After his trials, fake trials. You remember reading about him, don't you? They lied about him. They lied on him. Well, he said, you know, tear it down. And he said, well, if they knew what he meant, he didn't say he would raise the... the raise it up in three days. He was talking about himself. See, they, they, they lied. Well, is this true? And he held his peace. Is this true? He held his peace. He knew when to, he knew when to speak and when not to speak. Some of us need to learn that lesson. We're just a few days away, but... On that Sunday before he resurrected, a special event took place that fulfilled the prophecy of Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. And I love this story. We call this the triumphal entry. And we're going to, of course, talk about Jesus because everything should be about Jesus anyway. Because he's the only reason why we're here and the only reason why we're in this building right now. We're worshiping Him. But we want to focus a little bit on the crowd that day. Luke 19 is where you'll find the physician's account of the triumphal entry. Let's begin our reading in verse number 28. And when he, Jesus, had thus spoken, he went before sending up to Jerusalem. And it came to pass when he was come nigh to Bethpage and Bethany at the mount called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples. Now, what, what you want you to notice is you're going to read the words disciples in two different contexts. Okay, and we'll distinguish the context this morning. But here's the first. He sent two of his disciples, saying, Go ye into the village over against you, in the which 
at your entering you shall find a colt tied, wherein on yet never man sat. Loose him and bring him hither. And if any man ask you, why do you loose him? Thus shall you say unto him, because the Lord hath need of him. And they that were sent went their way and found even as he said unto them. And as they were loosing the colt, the owners thereof said unto them, Why loose you the colt? Well, that's amazing. Jesus said they were going to say it, and they said it. And they said, The Lord hath need of him. And they brought him to Jesus and cast their garments upon the colt. And they set Jesus thereon. And as he went, they spread their clothes in the way. And when he was come nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, See, I want you to notice, the Pharisees weren't just kind of in a little group outside of the big crowd. They were among the multitude. Be careful of the Pharisees among the multitude. You with me? You following what I'm saying, don't you? You're, you? Have you been in church long enough to notice the Pharisees among the multitude? See, they ain't all, all by themselves off in a, little, in, a, in a little huddle, right? It ain't like a football field where they're off in a little huddle trying to figure out their next play on what they want to do inside the church. No, they're among the multitude. You with me? you're with me, shake your head yes. Okay, good. Good deal. And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And he answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. Heavenly Father, as we break the bread of life for a few minutes, speak to us, minister to us. If there's one here that's not saved, Lord, may today be the day they give their life to you. And Father, we know you'll save them today. Lord, be with the Christians here that just need a special touch from the throne room of heaven. And we know you'll grant that in your time and in your way. And I also pray in your son's precious and holy name. Amen. There are four groups of people that we see in Luke's account of the triumphal entry. Well, first notice that he's not coming into Jerusalem on a horse. That's very important, is it not? A horse would mean that we're coming to war. Think about when Jesus comes back after the, 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 the seven years of tribulation. Is he coming back on a donkey? Come back on a horse, is he not? Why? Because he's going to come and he's going to defeat Satan forevermore. Come and set his millennial reign. And, and we know the story, how it's, we, don't, we can't conceive how it's going to look, but we know what it's going to happen because we see it in Revelation. He's not, he's not riding into Jerusalem on a horse. So we already know for a fact that he's not there to do what they want him to do. Jesus doesn't always do what you want him to do. Why? Because his ways are higher than ours. His thoughts are higher than ours. He knows better than we do. Even though you think you know better than God, you don't. God knows exactly what He's doing. He's going to do it in His time and in His way. Oh, you may think He's late in doing what you want Him to do. Or you may think that He's late in, in, in Him doing what He wants to do. Well, He's been laying there for four days if you'd have just been here, Jesus, he'd have been alive, he'd have been well, you could have healed him. Lazarus would have been A-OK -okay if you were here. And he said, I I'm doing the will of my Father. I wasn't here because you wanted me to. And we know the rest of the story, Lazarus come forth. When you think he's four days late, he's right on time. He's right on time. Is he not? They wanted him there to overthrow the Roman government in a battle so that everything would be, in their mind would be just hunky-dory. That's, that's not why Jesus was there. That's not why he came into Jerusalem. 
And that's why he's not on a horse, because he wasn't there uh, for battle. As far as you know what I mean, a, a physical battle. He's there for a battle, of course, the spiritual warfare that you and I have to deal with still every day. But he wasn't there to overthrow the Roman government. That's why he told, told him, go get the donkey. Go get the coat. Because of humility. Jesus was the most humble. You know what I mean? He's the Savior. I'm going to use the word human being because he is 100% man. 100% God, yes, but 100% man. Most humble human being that ever lived on planet Earth. That's why he said, go get the donkey. You ever been around donkeys? We lived in the parsonage over at... Now, they can get mean. You ever been around a mean one? And they'll protect exactly what they're supposed to... You ever seen... It's amazing. We lived in a parsonage. We had... This man across the street had several head of cattle. You know what he put in there? A donkey. You know why? Because we had coyotes. What would those coyotes do to those, those cows? Annihilate them. What did the donkey do to the coyotes? There were several times I'd walk out and say, well, killed another one. <laughs> Last night, they'd be laying in the field. You ever been around donkeys? Even though they can get mean and they'll protect what they're supposed to protect, it's a sign of humility. And that's Jesus. And that's why he humbled himself, according to, is it, is it Colossians 1? I can't remember. Colossians 1, he humbled himself even to death on a cross for you and for me Amen. and for the world. The whole world, past, present, future, Jesus Christ on Friday, he died and shed his blood for the sins of the world. A donkey, not a horse. But notice the crowds, notice the groups of people on that day. Number one, we want to point out the disciples, the first context of disciples. In verse number 29, he says, he tells his disciples, he sends them, go to the village over there, get the colt, get the donkey, bring them back. Not one man has ever sat on this donkey. And if they tell you to bring them back, or, or excuse me, why are you taking them? Say, I we're bringing them back because the Lord hath need of them. Notice the disciples. Notice their response. We're going to look at the responses of the crowd. The responses of the disciples is what? Obedience. Now the disciples in this context are the two of the twelve. The two of the twelve, including Judas, he's in the twelve, even now, because he hasn't, he hasn't um, betrayed him yet. The disciples, the two he sent, were two of the twelve. And notice their obedience. He tells them, if, if the owners say something, answer them this way. If not, don't worry about it. But I'm sending you over there to bring back the donkey. And what did they do? They went and they brought back the donkey. That's obedience. Is it not? Jesus told them what to do. He left nothing out. And he said, go do it. And they did it. Why aren't we doing exactly what God says to do? Well, did He give me everything I'm supposed to have to fulfill His will? Yeah. He's left nothing out. He's given you everything you need. Number Well, the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, what more you need? You don't need anything else. If God sees fit to... To, to have maybe a mentor in your life, allow God to bring that person in your life. Quit fighting it. Obey the Word of God. Why? Because that's what God says. God Himself, Jesus Christ, said three times, If you love me, 
keep my commandments. And John takes that thought in 1 John 1 and 1 John 5. He says, this is how we know we love him if we keep his commandments. Don't sit there and say, well, I think this might be a commandment. You think, that's your first problem is you're thinking. Quit thinking. No, we know what the Bible says is right, and we know what the Bible says is wrong. If you're saved, obey God. If he says don't do something, don't do it. If he says to do something, do it. How simple can it get? And they obeyed. They could have gotten over there to that village, started loosening that colt, and here come the owners. Why are you taking him? Uh, like Joe Biden. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Start getting tongue tied. Uh, this is yours. We understand this is yours. We are sorry. We're going to leave now. That's not what they did. They said exactly what God Himself told them to say. The Lord hath need of him. Now, we're going to get to the owners in a minute. Can they control how the owners respond to the Lord hath need of them? No, they can't control that, can they? No. The only thing they can control is what Jesus told them to do. Go get him. If they say, why, why are you taking him? The Lord hath need of them. And they did exactly that to a T. They didn't leave anything out. But yet you and I, buddy, you better believe we leave some stuff out. Why? Obey him. Well, I might lose this friend. Okay. Well, my family might get mad at me. Okay. If your friend and your family's lost until they get saved, they're going to hell. Don't worry. You, you, you know, you pray for them and you witness to them, but you can't control if they get saved. The only thing you can't control... It's how you respond to God. That's the only thing you can't control, how you respond to Him. They went and did as He said. James 4, 17. I'm paraphrasing. Well, let's go read it. Instead of par let's, let's read this. James chapter 4 and verse number 17. The very last verse of the chapter says this. Give you, give you a second. James 4, 17. Therefore, and the word therefore means because of what I've just said, and we don't have time to get to what James has said but prior to this verse, but listen to what he says. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Now, that ought to kick us in the rear end. Why? Because we know what's good. What's good is to obey God, right? right? And we don't do it to Him that's sin. Knowingly, just out of pure rebellion to God, we're going to do the exact opposite of what He says. Or question it. Well, did God really say that? Did God really tell me to do that? Uh... Yes. Can you confirm it with the Word of God? Yeah, of course. I can confirm it. Then do it! It ain't hard, is it? Shouldn't be. The disciples, the two of the twelve, he sent to go get the donkey. They did exactly what he told them to do. Obedience. Notice the owners, number two. If you're writing these down, go ahead and write this down. The disciples obeyed their obedience, their response. What's the owner's response to Jesus. Now all they got is the Lord hath need of him. That's all. That's the only message they got about Jesus, is it not? We think that we got to have this old 30 minute sermon and this big eloquent, you want an eloquent sermon, you got the wrong guy. 
But we think we got to have this big, eloquent, 30-minute sermon about Jesus, and that's how people are going to respond. The only thing that they got about Jesus is, the Lord hath need of him. That's it. Now, are they required to respond to that message? Yes, because every time you and I hear about Jesus, we are required to respond to that word. Every time. There's no exceptions. They are required to respond to the Lord hath need of him. What's their response? Sacrifice. Well, that's my donkey. That's mine. Right? You ever been around kids? And they're trying, and we're trying our hardest as parents to try to get them to start playing with one another. And they start playing in the other room. And all of a sudden, about, I mean, not not even five minutes later, if they start playing in that room, what do you hear? At mine! At my toy! Daddy, they punched me! That was my toy, and I took it from them. They hit me! At mine! That's what, we, that's what we hear, don't we? Well, the owners own this donkey. They owned it. They paid for it. They owned it. And here they see two cats untying their donkey, and they ask them, What in the world are you doing, boys? Well, the Lord hath need of this donkey, this coat. They didn't say, It's ours. It's mine. You can't have it. They said, Take him. They gave up what was theirs to the Lord. Now, don't misunderstand me. I know everything we've got is the Lord's anyway. Make sense? But God does come by our way from time to time and say, give this up. Or give that up. Sacrifice this. Why? Because we get... We understand the ultimate sacrifice. If you're saved and born again by the grace of God, you understand and have and have understood, gotten to the point of understanding the true meaning of sacrifice. Because Jesus himself sacrificed. The Lamb of God sacrificed himself. Remember, they didn't kill him. He willingly gave himself up. And we understand that. And because he did that for us, if God comes by our way and says, give this up, give that up, what are we going to say? It's mine. God, I can't do that. It's mine. At my boat. At my golf clubs. That's my money. Your money? You kidding me? Where you think that money came from? Grew on a tree? God gave it to you. you. Are we on the same page? And they didn't say, no, you can't have him. That donkey's ours. That colt is ours. You can't have him. They didn't say that. They said, take him to the Lord. Their response to the message of what was theirs, what they owned, their response was, take him. What's God telling you to give up? Is it hard to give stuff up? Oh, yeah. Some some more than others can be harder for some more than others. But God will come by. Now, I'm not saying this is the case because it's not the case for these owners. But a lot of the times God will tell us to give something up because it's getting very, very close to number one in our life. It's getting very close. Or may have already replaced God as number one in your life. Not not close. Forget close. It may have already replaced him. And God says, I'm number one. I should be number one in your life. But you've replaced me with such and such thing or such and such this or that or another. And God says, you've got to give it up so that I can be number one in your life. What's God What have you got number one in your life? Hopefully it's the Lord. I'm asking myself that question too. I ain't just asking you. What's Jonathan Gann got number one in his life? We all praise the Lord, amen, for all of us. But there may be times where God says, give this up. 
How are we going to respond to that? Are we going to say, take it? Now, will he keep it forever and not ever give it back to you as long as you live on this earth? Maybe, maybe not. That's up to him. And we're going to trust him on that, on, on that end. He might bring it back. He may not. But that's up to him. The only thing we need to be concerned about right now is if he says give this up, give it up. Amen? So we see the disciples, the two of the twelve, obedience, the owners, they sacrificed. Then we see the second uh, context of disciples in verse number 36. And as he went... They spread their clothes in the way, and when he was come nigh even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. We see the word disciples again. This is not the twelve. The word disciple means what? Follower of Jesus. Now, this can be debatable among Christians, and that's fine. But I will share something with you that I believe uh, that can be proven from Scripture. You can be saved if you have repented of your sins, come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, ask Him to forgive you, right? That's salvation. That's settling it with the Lord, your salvation of your soul, right? We agree, hopefully we agree on that. But I believe you can be saved and not be a follower. You can be born again and be a lazy Christian. You with me? My question to you is, if you're saved, are you following him? This comes back to our discussion of obedience. If you're disobeying him, you can't be following him. You're not following him. You're going the opposite direction. You're saved, but you ain't following him. This crowd followed him. They were his disciples. They loved him enough to follow him. And these disciples here, this multitude, what was their response to Jesus when they saw him come nigh? It was praise. It was praise. God deserves every glory, honor, and praise we have within us. Did you know that? He deserves every bit of it. And he's going to get the praise. If we as Christians don't give it to him, if we somehow not follow him, if we somehow we start disobeying him, whatever the case may be, oh, that means Jesus won't get his praise. Oh, he'll get it because he told the Pharisees, if they shut their mouth, then the stones will praise me. Creation will praise me. Now, he's not boasting in himself. He's not trying to puff himself up. He's not trying to show how prideful Jesus is. Well, I'm God. In human flesh. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is he will get the praise and he desires the praise from his children. Are you praising him? Are you glorifying him? Listen, how you praise him? Listen, I don't know how you praise him. Do you praise him with music? You praise him with Bible study? Do you praise him with, with uh, godly, healthy conversations with other Christians? Notice what I said, godly, healthy conversations. Why? Because you, listen, you get five Christians in a room, you bring up a doctrinal topic, you're going to get seven opinions. Amen? But you can have a godly, healthy relation, or a conversation even if you disagree on doctrinal issues. Does that make sense? That's praise. Do you know what an act of worship is? Y'all don't have any tomatoes, do you? It's something about when preachers bring up money, everybody starts going, oh, geez. But an act of worship is the giving of tithes and offerings. That's an act of worship. That's an act of praise. Giving back a portion of what he's already blessed you with. Amen? That's an act of worship. Have you given? Do you praise him that way? How do you praise him? And then the question is, if you're not, why aren't you? What's holding you back from praising Almighty God? What's holding you back from praising Jesus who died and saved you from your sins, from hell, and from the grave? Amen. What's holding you back from praising Jesus? They threw their palm branches on the ground. 
they rejoiced, um, praising God in verse number 37. Blessed, verse 38, be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. You don't have to say those exact words, but that's how they praised him that day. His disciples, his followers. How are you praising him? You pray, act of worship, prayer. That's an act of worship. Just talking to him. That's it. You and somebody else can talk each other's head off. But when it comes to talking to God, we shut our mouth. Don't do that. Act of praise, act of worship is praying to God, talking to Him. How are you praising Him? Are you saying, uh, blessed be the King? Are you saying, thank you, Lord, for dying on the cross for my sins? Thank you for saving me. How are you praising Him? How are you praising Him? And then lastly, we see the Pharisees. Buddy, we, we get three good responses to the Lord. And, and somehow, this, this crowd creeps in, and we've got to talk about them. The Pharisees, what's their response? Their response was unbelief. Unbelief. And some of the Pharisees, verse 39, from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. Isn't that amazing? They told Jesus, now, this is layman terms. This is 2023 wording. Okay, you ready for this? This is what they told Jesus. Tell them to shut up. You just told Jesus to tell a group of people to shut up. How smart is that? <laughs> That's real brilliant. To tell the Savior of the world, to tell a group of people to shut their mouth. That didn't work out too good, did it? Have you, you trying to tell God what to do, has that, all, has that worked out for you? No. It hasn't worked out for me. And he tells them, even if they hold their peace, even if they say not a word of praise, even if they don't say, blessed be the king that come in the name of the Lord, even if they don't say none of those things, creation will praise me. And that, that's wonderful how Jesus responds to stupidity. I don't respond to stupidity all that well, okay? I just don't. That's me. I'm not saying I'm right, wrong, whatever. I just don't. But Jesus does. He knows how to. Well, you Pharisees. Now, that doesn't mean he was always gentle with them. I mean, you call someone whitewashed tombs. You call them brood of vipers, Right? generation of vipers he wasn't always gentle with them but even when he wasn't he still was humble in his response okay i'm not always humble in my responses to stupidity see you can educate ignorance but you can't fix stupid right does that make sense and jesus he just said well even if they don't say a word the stones will cry out I wonder how the Pharisees responded to that. What? The stones? Yeah. Creation will cry out to me. See, their unbelief sent them to hell. The Pharisees, Sadducees, scribes, all that crowd up there, they, they didn't believe. They wanted to kill him. They didn't want to kill him for what he did. Did you ever notice that? I want you to go back and study this this week. Go study the Gospels, the last few chapters of each Gospel. They didn't want to kill him for what he did. They didn't want to kill him because he, he healed somebody. That didn't bother them. They wanted to kill him for what he said. Remember in John 17, the great prayer? I and the Father are one. You and I are one. They wanted to kill him because he said he was God. And they didn't like it. When they went to arrest him, when they got their little, little uh, plan to arrest him, and they sent a group out, I can't remember exactly what they asked him, but they asked him a question to trap him in his speech so they could arrest him. And they came back empty-handed. Do you remember? Where is he? No man spake like this man. 
They couldn't arrest him. For the very reason they wanted to arrest him because of what he said, they couldn't do it because when they heard him speak, they heard the authority out of his mouth. Unbelief. Instead of just accepting it, you saw him heal. You heard him preach. You see the evidence. Well, bring us a sign. He said, I've done give you, given you signs. But there's one that I haven't given you yet that I will give you. And what was he talking about? His resurrection. And that is a sign. That he is who he says he is. Anyone in the world can lay the claim of being the Savior. Oh, you can lay the claim. No one's going to stop you from doing that. Can you prove it? If you lay the claim of being the Savior and we kill you on a cross on three days, are you going to come back to life? Not you and not me. Jesus did. They wanted to kill him for what he said because they couldn't believe his words. I'm so glad I got to the point where I believe his words. Do you believe his words? Do you believe the red letters? I do. I believe the black letters too. But the red letters, when he says, I and the Father are one, he and the Father are one. Because James, uh, excuse me, um, is it James or 1 John 5, where it says three bear record in heaven? The Father, we know who that is. The Word, a capital W, we know who that is. We know that's Jesus because in 1 John it says the Word became flesh. And it says the Spirit, the Holy Ghost. And these three are what? I believe in the Trinity. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Jesus said it and it's true. But they couldn't believe it. Are you here this morning and you haven't believed the words of Jesus? You haven't responded to the messages of Christ that He is the Savior. He died for you. You haven't, you, you haven't responded with faith and repentance and trust and hope in Christ. You keep, unbelie you, you, you keep your unbelief present in your life. Replace it with belief. And be saved this morning. Quit putting it off. Because you never know when it's going to be eternally too late for you. Right. And once you slip off into eternity, it'll be it. Right. No more chances. Are you like the Pharisee? Unbelief? Or have you believed? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life, eternal life with Him. Isn't that good? We may not be able to enjoy everything about eternal life, but do you know that we already have it? We're able to experience it. Whosoever believeth in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Not will have, have it now. I'm so glad that God saved me. So here's the invitation. Very simple. I want you to pay attention. Christian and lost friend alike, pay attention to this, okay? Lost friend, here's the invitation for you. You've had unbelief present in your life all this time. You heard about Jesus, you've heard about Jesus. This may be the first time you've heard about Jesus. You might have heard about Jesus a thousand times before, and you've never responded with belief. You're like the Pharisee. You're trying to tell God, tell them to hush, or God, do this, or God, I'll believe when you do this in front of me. No, you're not going to negotiate with him. Okay? You need to hear about Jesus, that he died on the cross for you, and believe in him. Confess that he is the Savior. Amen? That's for you, lost friend. Christian, how have you responded to Jesus recently? Is there something God has given up, give, asking you, telling you to give up? And you just keep hanging on. Come and pray about it. Ask God to give you strength. When's the last time you praised Him? Do you know an act of worship is coming in this altar and praying to Him? 
You say, well, do I have anything to praise him for recently? What has he done in my life? Oh, well, if you have to think about it, you're already in trouble. But when's the last time you praised him for saving you? When's the last time you praised him for the gospel? Will you come and praise him today in, in this altar of prayer? Praise him. Just praise him. Say, Lord, thank you for whatever's on your heart. I'm, I, we're, we're inviting you to come, Christian, to come praise him. We have so much, do we have so much to be thankful for? Come, come and praise Him and thank Him today in this altar of prayer. All right, let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we take a minute or two for an invitational hymn, Lord, I pray for the lost, that they'll come and they'll respond with belief. I pray that they'll come and talk to me, pray with me, and we'll share the gospel with them and how to be saved. And Lord, I pray for the Christian to come and that they will come and praise Him Come ask Him for, for strength in this life. Maybe to sacrifice something, to give something up. Maybe they have struggled with obedience recently. Lord, I pray they come and ask, and ask for forgiveness for their disobedience, but ask for strength for obedience. Lord, have Your will and way over these next few moments, and I also pray in Your Son's precious name. Amen. Everyone standing. Brother Jimmy, what number? Page 49. 49. Come. Come and be saved and come praise the Lord in this altar of prayer today. ever a week that we need to celebrate the Holy Week. Allow it to be this week. Let your, allow your devotionals, your devotional time with the Lord, with your families to be centered around what, what's, what's happened this week and what Jesus did in the last few days <clears throat> before His death and resurrection. And of course, as we draw closer to Good Friday, the Resurrection Sunday, just uh, spend some time in Scripture, okay? It's good to come to church. It's good to hear the preaching of the Word. It's good to hear the preaching about Resurrection Sunday and the death. But God commands us to study to show ourselves approved. Does that make sense? So study the Word with you and your families this week, especially this week. And once you do this week, you'll say, oh, I, I enjoy that. You know, God blessed that. God honored that. Then you'll continue on in the following weeks with you and your families. Just reading Scripture together and praying. Can we, can we commit to doing that with one another? I believe God will honor that and God will bless it. Any words of testimony before we pray? Brother Jonathan, I'd like to praise God today. God's so good. He's just so good to us. Amen. And eight years ago, I had surgery. I had cancer and I had surgery. And the doctor gave me six months to live. Mm -hmm. That was eight years ago yesterday. And I praise God for the extra time. Amen. Every day is another day that He's given me since that eight years. Amen. And I just can't help but not praise God Amen. because He's been so good to me. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. I praise God for giving me life, for giving me salvation, mm -hmm. for being there every day, every hour, every minute for me. I couldn't live without it. I couldn't do without it. And my third, I had cancer mm -hmm. nine years ago. One year before she found out she had hers. Mm -hmm. And I went through two years. Of it. <coughs> okay. 
if I didn't praise you, just like you say, the stones, the rocks you cry out for him. And I praise you every day. Amen. Thank you. Any other words of testimony? Before we pray. Anyone else? Jonathan? Yep. I think a lot of people see Christ on the cross. Mm -hmm. I don't think they really realize how much he suffered. I think they think right. in Jesus is not really feeling anything. Mm -hmm. But he was man. He was human. They say that no other person on the face of earth suffered like he did right. on the cross. Right. Yep. Thank you, Brother Jamie. Wasn't just a physical, it was a spiritual. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You think he just said that just to fill some words in while he was hanging there? You think he really felt the forsaking of the Father? He felt it, didn't he? Man, can you imagine spiritually what that felt like? You and I, Christians, will never feel the forsaking of, the, uh, of God. I will never leave you nor forsake you, right? That's a promise. He's kept it. But Jesus did feel it. Can you imagine that? Thank you, Brother Jimmy. Anything? Yes, sir. Randy? True. We need the Lord. Anything else? <clears throat> Thank you. Anything else? Thank you for the words of testimony today. I'm going to ask Dad if he would dismiss us with a word of prayer.